So you started playing Loop Hero and you love it, but you don't know how to unlock all this equipment or what you need and how to farm it. Don't worry, I got you. But first, the basics. There are settings to pause the game after a battle or a loop, but you can also pause the action by hovering your mouse over characters, status effects, or even the items in your inventory. You can also just hold down left click as well. This green gauge in the top left hand corner shows you the time of day. It moves as you walk and during attacks and battles. This will determine things like when enemies will spawn and when you'll get your health bonus if you have items or cards that provide that. You don't have to play every card right away. There are a few reasons for this. Playing cards will fill up your boss meter and ultimately summon them. This can be pretty scary if you didn't spend enough time looping for good items and experience. Remember that time passes when you battle, so the more fights you create along the map, the longer your jaunt will take, and that means more enemy spawns every time the rooster crows. Now, some landscape cards have two versions, a lower and a higher quality one. A big game changer for me was when I realized I could ignore the lower quality ones and wait for the better versions to come along. Consider playing only those cards that you need and let the others fill up in your tray. What did you just say? But what about all these cards? You're just gonna burn them? Yeah, the extra cards will burn from left to right and this turns them into memory fragments and 10 of these turn into a book of memories. You can use these to unlock some lore, sweet right? But you can also disassemble them with alchemy later on to turn that resource into something you need instead. Let's talk about the warrior first. The warrior does well if you focus on HP regen, max HP, and your defense stat. When you unlock the arsenal golden card, it opens up a new equipment slot which adds retaliation damage as well. For landscaping tiles, bring mountains and rocks since they increase your character's max health. Try to avoid the desert and sand dunes cards since they reduce everyone's max HP, including your own. This class is fine, but I personally had a lot more success with the other two classes. Let's turn to the rogue now. This class gets its items in a unique way. Every time you defeat an enemy, you get a treasure which is stashed in this bag. Once you make a loop all the way back to camp, you'll automatically hand in all those treasures for some sweet gear. I really like to build a sick attack speed and damage all build that you can see in another video. It was more or less unstoppable even for the hardest bosses. But before you get everything you need to pull that off, start with a focus on evasion, attack speed, and crits. If you're having trouble staying alive, consider adding outposts to your deck. This building normally takes all the rare items you get from a fight as payment for sending you this guy, but since the rogue collects treasures instead of items, the outpost will do all the work for free. Pretty handy. If you go with the arsenal golden card, you'll get to equip a necklace which gives you a magic shield and this is really powerful against general mobs, especially early on. Normally you can end a fight without even getting through this shield, and with the innate 5% vampirism the rogue has, it really helps with your survivability. Some final points, the rogue still collects quest items as normal if you're questing for a village, but the battlefield card, which spawns these chests, won't spawn amazing gear like normal. Instead, it will give you nothing other than a stable branch. The necro is all about summoning, and has three stats which directly affect his skeletons. All the other stats only apply to the necro himself. You might you might be tempted to get so many skeletons, but you only need 3 or 4 for a boss fight. Keep an eye on your skeleton level, it should be at or higher than the loop number, and in general, focus on increasing your skeleton level over the quality. Now if you focus on attack speed, your character will summon skeletons faster since the necro will always summon first and attack with his really pitiful attack once he's reached MAX SKELETONS. To improve attack speed, always bring forest and thicket cards to battle. When you place 10 of these, you'll spawn a tile which creates these woodmen who only counter attack. Since the necro rarely directly attacks enemies, your summons will do all the hard work which means free XP and items. Deserts and sand dunes are also useful since their health reduction doesn't affect your magic shield or your summons. If you've unlocked the ancestral crypt golden card, you'll notice that its drawback is preventing any HP boosting stats in your run, but the necro never gets this stat. Instead, you gain health for every kill of an enemy with a soul, and this works really well for the necro. Lastly, avoid the outpost cards since they have a beef with people who reanimate the dead. They'll attack both you and the enemies. Moving on to retreating, when things get too dicey, you can get to camp in three ways. When you find yourself on the camp tile, you'll see this gold outline around the retreat button. Pressing it now will allow you to return with everything. If you retreat from anywhere else on the loop, you'll only keep 60%. And if you die on the loop, you'll only keep 30% of your resources. Once you start beating the bosses, you'll collect orbs of immortality, which you can use to go ahead and take all the resources anyways. Right, what to build at camp. Don't worry if you've already bought some upgrades, you'll want to get everything in the end anyways, but if you're just starting out, try to focus on the herbalist hut since it unlocks healing potions. They automatically heal you when your health goes below this little marker on your health, and you refill two potions every time you pass the campfire. Now you also automatically heal once you pass the cozy campfire, and if you build a field kitchen, it will increase this healing by an extra 10%. To help with early farming, I found the watchtowers to be 
be a huge buff. You can build up to four of these, and they give you a ranged ally who, at first, will help attack one tile away from the campfire in either direction. This means I was able to stack all the hardest mobs right up near my camp tile and get back up from all my archer buddies. Each upgrade on these towers extend their range and damage, making this a building I focused on upgrading early on. Lastly, you'll want to unlock the smelter. It grants you the arsenal card, which opens up additional equipment slots that I spoke about earlier. Synergies and things to look out for. Remember how some landscape tiles have low and high quality versions? Well, here's an easy synergy that works with rocks or mountains. The first time in an expedition that you place any of these cards in a 3x3 square, they will transform into a huge mountain with different stats and spawns a harpy every couple days. Also, every 10 of these cards you play will randomly place a goblin camp or a woodman village somewhere on your loot. If these things are messing up your run, make sure you have an oblivion card in your hand to erase them before you drop that 10th card. Be careful if you're overlapping battlefield cards. This will create a tile that spawns blood clots. That's great for your encyclopedia, but these guys can be hard to kill. Groves and forests can spawn blood groves, which kill enemies who drop below 15% HP. But if you build a second blood grove off of a first blood grove, you'll make a hunger grove, which kills enemies at 20%, but also damages you occasionally. Either way, I loved having blood groves for the boss fight, since 15% is a lot of HP on a boss. Ruins seem like cool cards, since they give you a random resource, but they can be super dangerous. The giant worms are ranged and can attack you from the next tile. They also have this annoying chance to flee battle and avoid death at the last second, which means they can still attack you if you fight on the tile after them. This card has ruined plenty of my runs, and definitely avoid putting ruins beside your campfire since they will actually help the boss and attack you as well. If you do like using them, bring a blood grove card since it kills them just before they reach their escape threshold. The river card doubles the effect of the tiles beside it. Try to have a river touch a tile no more than twice, since sharing a border three or four times will actually only buff that tile 1.5 times instead of the two times for the first two sides. The treasury is pretty useful early on when farming materials. It spawns a massive amount of resources if you're able to fill in all eight tiles surrounding it. The rewards are better at higher loop levels, so if possible, keep at least one tile unfilled until you're about to end your run. Lastly, when you finally trigger the first boss, it'll spawn several buildings around the campfire. Each of these palaces will increase its stats by 5%. There are two ways to help out with this. Try crowding the campfire with as many cards as you can. This prevents the Lich from even spawning any buildings to begin with. You can also try to hold on to as many Oblivion cards as possible to delete them before the fight. Finally, what to farm while looping. I was farming like a champion until I found out that I needed roughly 1 billion orbs of expansion to keep upgrading my camp. These things don't even drop from specific mobs. Instead, they have a small chance to drop after a battle with four or more enemies. You'll need tiles that spawn a lot of mobs, and luckily ranged attackers count towards the total number of enemies as well. I highly recommend that you start farming them as soon as you're able. The easiest way I found to do this was to get as many watchtowers as I could and to pack the tiles in their range with as many spawns as possible. For example, the vampire mansion spawns vampires if there's another mob present, and you can put swamps in their range since these tiles make lifesteal hurt. Or you can place a village next to a vampire mansion to change the village into a zombie infestation, which spawns zombies plus a vampire, but after three loops the village upgrades and does doesn't spawn zombies anymore. You can also try your luck with the temporal beacons. It covers a huge range, but these watchers are difficult to kill, so make sure you can dish out enough damage. That reminds me, I also needed to farm some astral orbs, which I found out only dropped in the second, third, and fourth chapter, and only from a few enemies, including these watchers. Each chapter has a different cap to how many items you can bring back, but if you manage to get the resource drop-off skill when you level up, you can get away with farming at the earlier chapters if it helps. You're now ready to take on anything, so go forth loop hero and comment below if you found this helpful since it will help more people find my video.